And hey, hello everyone, it's lovely to see so many people um, here this evening uh, to learn about my favourite group of animals, uh, which are bees. Um, so what I'm going to uh, do today is it's going to be a fairly informal event um, and it's you know a public engagement event, so please feel free to, to comment and, and ask questions throughout. Uh, but I'm going to sort of run through um, an introduction to bees, you know, what are bees, uh, why are they important, what are their habitats, their behaviour and their ecology, um, why is Birmingham Black Country an interesting place to be, to be learning and thinking about bees? Um, so I'll run through this and um, you can ask questions throughout um, and there'll be some some opportunities to, to learn a little bit more about uh, the, the reason that this area is so unique uh, for these really interesting, this really interesting group of animals. So just to begin with, um, I'll try and keep this not too overly scientific so that a, a general audience can, can understand, but, but what actually is a bee? Um, so we hear about bees in the news, we've seen bees in our gardens, um, but actually trying to understand what this organism is, um, where it comes from, um, and its, its role in the animal kingdom it can be a really difficult question to answer. Um, but bees, in, in the, the most simplest form, they're insects, and they're actually really, really closely related to an, other groups of insects like uh, wasps and ants. Um, and we actually call this group together the aculeates. Um, and it just comes from the Latin for acutus, which means stinger. And it basically means that all of, the, all of the insects within this group, they share the same biological feature on the end of their abdomen, which is the stinger. And in fact, bees are, are related to wasps and ants. They actually come, they're, they're, they're descendants of wasps. People often ask me, what's the point of wasps? Well, bees are basically vegetarian wasps. Um, and they're extremely important uh, for the health and stability and the structure of our ecosystem and the health of our plant communities. Um, and the reason why they're important for plant communities is because of a process called pollination. Um, and you'll have heard about pollination uh, many, many times, I imagine. And um, pollination is basically just sexual reproduction in plants. It's the way that, that plants reproduce. And they do this through these really interesting, charismatic and quite, quite colorful and cute animals, uh, which we call bees. Um, and extremely hairy, you'll probably have noticed the, one of the key features about a bee that sort of separates it from other animals um, and other insects is that they're, they're hairy, they look fluffy, they, they look quite cute. Um, and they really do range in size. Um, so they can be anywhere from a few millimetres all the way up to a couple of centimetres. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those species that are that you probably won't see because they're so small and, and so niche. Um, and in the United Kingdom and throughout the world, we have two main sort of groups of bees. We have solitary bees and social bees. They have vastly different lifestyles, uh, life histories, behaviours, um, and they're important for different reasons to our ecosystem. The group that we know the most about uh, are the social bees, uh, and it's the group that most people will, would associate with, with being a bee. Um, but the solitary bees, they far outnumber the social bees. Uh, they're an extremely interesting group, very varied, um, and um, they're, they're the group that I, I've been studying for a few years. Um, I should also sort of introduce myself a little bit as well. So I'm Aaron and I'm an entomologist. I've been researching insects uh, in Birmingham, the Black Country, for the past few years. Um, and I'm uh, working at the University of Birmingham, doing my PhD, looking at habitat connectivity and pollinators. And I'm also doing a placement with the Birmingham Black Country Wildlife Trust. So what does a bee actually look like? What, what, what are these creatures and how do you differentiate them from, from other insects? Well, one of the key things, if, you, if you're trying to identify a bee, uh, and try to sort of characterize them is that they have two pairs of wings and um, so they have four individual wings altogether and this differs from different insect groups like flies for example which only have one pair of wings so two individual wings um, and you can actually learn a lot about um, the anatomy and the physiology of an insect or, or, an, or an organism by linking it back to its order so uh, bees are in the order called hymenoptera which literally uh, translates to wedding wings because it's a, it's the word um, actually comes from uh, the little hooks that join the two wings together. They're called hamuli. So in the hymenoptera, in this in this large group of bees, wasps, and ants and sawflies, um, they all share the same feature, which is two pairs of wings. Other groups like flies, they only have one pair of wings, and we call those diptera, die die for two, terra for wings, so two wings. Um, but yeah, they all. All the bees, wasps, and ants, they have four separate individual, wing, in, individual wings. They also have two small compound eyes. Um, and I say small, they might look quite large to us, but if you look at other insects like flies, they have massive eyes. Sometimes their eyes take up the entirety of their head. But bees, they have much more sort of uh, sleeker eyes um, and, and they have two compound eyes, but they also have this really other strange feature um, where they have these three light sensing cells on their head, where the little red circles you can see here, and these are called simple eyes or ocelli, 
And what these do is they sort of, they take in UV radiation from the sun and that enables the insect to sort of navigate across a landscape. It's how a bee is able to find its way home. It uses these light sensing cells on top of its head to actually enable it to, to, to navigate. Um, and they're quite robust insects. They're quite strong looking. They're not, they're not fiddly. They're not quite, um, I think, if you look at a fly, you think you'd probably pull a fly apart because it's so tiny. I mean, I wouldn't encourage it, but they have very, very sort of flimsy legs and they're quite skinny. Whereas uh, bees, they're quite, you know, they're quite tough. They have this integument around them, uh, which we call um, a cuticle. And uh, it makes them quite tough, quite strong, quite robust. And they're extremely strong flyers as well. They can fly very, very large distances, anywhere from about 300 metres up to about two kilometres. Um, and... Um, like I said before, bees, wasps, ants, they, they all share this, this feature. They have a stinger on their abdomen. Um, and that's probably what they're most well known for, that, that you know, bees sting and people are often afraid of, of bees trying to sting them. Um, but bees are incredibly docile insects. They, they try not to harm other, other creatures if they don't have to. Um, they just want to sort of go about their life. And they have their, their stingers as purely a defensive mechanism. Um, but one of the other key features that you can look out for because we often see lots of lots of insects visiting our flowers in our gardens every year. And how do you how do you know one from another? But it is really difficult, um, not least because a lot of other lots of insects try to mimic what bees look like because bees are kind of considered uh, to be robust. They could be quite strong to look like a bee is an advantage in, in the insect world because, you know, you don't get attacked by other animals as, as much. Um, so it can be quite difficult, but if you look for two pairs of wings, if you look for the two big compound eyes, and if you look for segmented antennae. So what I mean by this is if you look at the antennae of this bee here, with this helicted, it's a, it's a type of furry bee, um, you can see that the, the actual antennae are built up of little segments. And you can see here, again, it's a similar sort of structure to the way the antennae are built. They're quite strong and they protrude forward. Whereas um, in, in other animals like flies, um, the, the antennae can be quite small and sort of knobbly and they're just like little bits on the top of their head. In, in groups like sawflies, which are very, very closely related to bees, um, the antennae are really weird. You can have them like halfway down the face, underneath the mouth. It's very, very bizarre. But when, you, when you're looking at a bee, um, if you see these segmented sort of sections, and uh, if you're looking at a, a sort of robust animal with, with two simple eyes, then, you know, you're looking at a, a bee, a, a primary pollinator. So often when I ask people to think about a bee and, um, and imagine a bee, they won't think of this sketch here. Uh, so this is a sketch that was done of uh, a type of mining bee called Andrina dorsata uh, by Mike Bloxham, and he's a local entomologist in the, in the Birmingham Black Country area. And I really like this image because for me, this is what characterises a true bee. They don't always look like your classic bumblebee or fuzzy and, and large. Um, sometimes they can look quite waspy quite slim um, and that's because of this there's a huge diversity of forms out there and um, so there's almost two there's 270 species of bee in the united kingdom and i'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide and um, but this this massive diversity this massive variety of the different species really reflects the nature of the society in which we live in and the, and the landscape that we live with all these different habitats um, but i really like what i really like about this is it, this image is it shows them it's sort of in their truest purest form um, and you can see here that they have these really beautiful, intricate wings. So a lot of the time you can actually identify bees, um, and this is kind of a little bit more higher in what we call taxonomy, um, but you can identify bees by looking at the, the shapes on their wings, what we call the wing venation. They make different patterns and that groups them into different genre, um, which allows us to then identify them down to species level. Um, but yeah, they're, they're incredibly interesting species and, and they have these uh, sort of what we call uh, pollen brushes and pollen baskets on their legs. Um, and this is, this is the whole purpose of the bee. It's to collect as much pollen as it possibly can. They're a pollinating machine, if you like. Um, and their entire anatomy, their, their, sorry, their physiology is, is built to collect as much pollen as they possibly can and transfer it from plant to plant. And they are, they've evolved for millions and millions of years to be fantastic at this. So every single inch of their um, body is sort of is evolved and adapted to, to be perfect for this role and this, this behavior. And an entire ecosystem depends on this interaction between these, these little tiny insects and, and the flowers that are trying to reproduce. And the entire modern landscape that we know to do today has been shaped by pollination. The only reason we have so many wildflowers, so many angiosperms, is because of the fact that we have uh, these 
species, what we call vectors or bees, to, to transfer pollen between plants and, and allow that to happen. It would be a very drab and colourless and, and almost very boring world without pollinators. Um, and it's very, very lucky for us that they like the same smells that we do. They like the smells of, then that's the, that's the entire purpose of, of flowers smelling nice and looking nice is to attract pollinators, not so much to attract humans, but to attract pollinators. So these tiny insects have a, a really remarkable impact uh, on the ecosystem as a whole and our, and our safety and stability within that. And it's all based on their physiology. So talking about diversity, um, there are around 20,000 different types of species of bee on planet Earth. And that's just the species that we know of. There are many, probably many, many more species out there that we, we haven't found yet in areas that we haven't explored. Um, and the UK, we're quite lucky in the United Kingdom um, because we have a nice section of this wildlife. And because we're in an island, we're you know nicely cut off from the, the, the mainland Europe. We can really study our bee populations as well as our bird populations and other, other groups of wildlife extremely well. For example, we know how many species are here. We don't have the problem of, of, of being in a really large landscape with different borders. Um, but what we what we know for certain is that we have around 270 species of bee in the United Kingdom. Now, 250 of those are solitary bees. Uh, and solitary bees, they make it the vast majority of species on Earth, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and to me, they're, they're the most interesting bees because they're the most effective pollinators. They're, they're what we would, we would call wild bees because they don't tend not to have a role in agriculture. They tend to support our wild ecosystems, our meadows, our grasslands, and, and, and the pollination services that they provide look after wild uh, wildlife rather than human nutrition. Um, but of, of the 270, so 250 are solitary bees. Um, they don't live in the hives, they don't live in the colonies. Usually it's a mother bee. She'll make her nest and she'll put an egg, a couple of eggs inside and she'll defend that nest um, while the male goes off and, and drinks nectar. And um, it's very different to say a honeybee hive can have up to 80,000 workers. It's quite a different environment. Bumblebees tend to be in the middle. They have around uh, between about 200 and 400 um, workers, but still nothing compared to a honeybee. A honeybee is, is an extremely sophisticated uh, species that has huge colonies um, and, and a really interesting uh, sort of social community. Um, but yeah, so 24 species are bumblebee and one species is the honeybee. And those 25 species make up the entire social bee fauna of the United Kingdom. And the other, the other 250 are solitary species. And they come in lots of different colours and shapes and forms. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about them uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. But let's start on the bumblebee. So I'm not ashamed to say that when I, a couple of years ago, and I didn't know anything about bees, this is what I thought a, a bee was. If somebody had told me to draw a bee, I would have drawn a bumblebee. Um, and bumblebees are fantastic. Um, the, the Latin for bumblebee is bombus. It's the, it's the genus name. It's what we call this group. Uh, and it literally means to buzz in Latin. Um, and I learned something really interesting about bumblebees the other day and about most bees. And, and that's when they fly, we, we often hear this buzzing sound, this, you know, this sort of low drumming buzz that you hear, uh, characteristic for spring, um, early spring day. And people often think that the buzz is coming from them beating their wing muscles really fast, but it's got nothing to do with that. It's actually to do with something called spiracles that they have on their body. And, and spiracles are like breathing holes. And, and bees and other insects are covered in these breathing holes all over their body. And as they fly, a bee has to produce lots of oxygen in order to get itself off the ground so it can beat its muscles. It has to beat its wings very, very quickly. And it sucks all this oxygen through the spiracles. And in the process of it breathing in all this air through its body, it actually creates this humming noise. That It actually creates the characteristic buzz of a bumblebee. Um, so that's where the, the buzz of the bumblebee actually comes from. Um, but yeah, they're really, really fascinating insects. They actually evolve in the, Himala uh, yeah, in the, in the Himalayas. They're high altitude flyers. Um, they, so they, they passed through the Himalayas, through this massive mountain ridge, flying through the mountain ridge and into Northern Europe. And then they settled in our gardens and in our meadows and grasslands. And that's actually how bees came to Europe. Um, I think there's about 250 species of bumblebee worldwide. Um, they don't produce honey in the way that we would assume that they would uh, think that they that they might. Uh, they do produce beeswax. They have very, very sort of small colonies um, and, it, and it varies. Some like to nest underground, uh, some like to nest in trees, hollows and, and sort of old bird boxes. Um, and some like to nest in sort of, the, we call these carder bees. They like to nest in the sort of tufts of grass. And what they do, it's really cute. They take lots of, uh, sort of stems of grass and they sort of 
curl them into a ball and then they'll have their entire colony inside this ball of, of soft grass and they'll sort of live on the surface of, of the grassland. Um, but yeah, really, really stunning animals. And they're incredibly important and increasingly important actually in agriculture. So people are often using bumblebees to, to pollinate um, sort of tomato plants and, and, and fruit and veg that are, that, that are used for human consumption. Um, but yeah, very fantastic pollinators. So there's 24 species of bumblebee in the UK. Seven of these species you will find in your garden. If you live in Birmingham, the Black Country, if, if you live pretty much anywhere in the UK, you, you will get about seven bumblebee species um, come into your garden. And uh, they're quite recognisable. Um, you, can, you can learn a lot about these species just by observing them in your garden. And you can really contribute to our understanding of bee populations throughout the entirety of the UK. Um, by submitting records uh, to our local record centre, eco records, about the bumblebees that you spot in your garden. And they're a really great group to get started on because they, but because of the, the number of species of bees in the UK, they can be quite difficult to identify them. Some, sometimes you need, tax, you need to use a microscope to look at them. Um, and and some, sometimes you can identify them in the field. Bumblebees as a group tend to be quite good in terms of identification in the field. You can get quite accurate identification and you don't need a massive amount of training. Um, you just need to be familiar with, with the different colours and bands of, of these different species. And there are plenty of resources out there uh, for you to do that. So I'd really encourage anyone this, this spring who's interested in bumblebees to um, go out in your garden and start recording them and, and submit your records to our local record centre. Um, and what we sort of do with these records is, is we... It, it goes into big databases that enable us to look at trends, population trends across the country, as well as in our local area. And it also allows us to, to create distribution maps. So these maps that you can see either side of the species, um, this actually shows us where a species is, um, where a species is declining, where a species is moving into a new area. And it's fantastic. Insects are incredibly susceptible. They're very sensitive to their environment. And because of that, it makes them really good indicators of environmental change. Um, it means that if you if you watch bumblebees closely, if you look at bee populations closely, you can look at the wider ecosystem. You can sort of take a, a, a small segment of the wider ecosystem and, and analyze that um, in, a, in a much more profound way. Um, so here's just a couple of, of um, the species that you might see. This is the red-tailed bumblebee. I think it's probably the most recorded bumblebee in Birmingham Black Country, and it's one of it's it's one of our, our favorites. But these are really, really charismatic creatures. In early spring, you'll have um, a queen that will emerge. Uh, she'll go out, she'll start collecting pollen and building a nest. Um, once she's laid a few of her eggs, those eggs will then look after the, the colony and look after the queen. She will never leave that nest again. Uh, and, the, and those little workers will go out and, and collect the pollen. And so you actually might see the size difference in bees over time. You might, at the start of the season, you might see quite large, sort of tired looking bees clinging onto flowers and that's a queen that's emerged from early from her hibernation in early spring she's probably starving she hasn't eaten for many many months um, and then later on in the year you'll get workers that come up and they're much more small and fluffy and they're quite interesting little creatures as well um, the honeybee is a really interesting animal too um, in fact it's, it's probably the most studied animal on earth um, competing with the fruit fly um, and the reason is because of the fact that it produces honey. It's, it's been sort of lauded as this miracle creature for, for many, many thousands of years. Um, and, you know, even Aristotle, um, going back to those of Aristotle and the early ancient Greeks, they, they worshipped these animals because they believed them to be sort of divine. Um, and honeybees are fantastic. They are the most abundant pollinator uh, on the planet and potentially the most widespread as well. And the kind of pollination that they do is that they're just not fussy. They will pollinate anything. They don't have a particular flower that they need to go to in order to survive. They'll go to any flower, they'll collect that pollen and collect that nectar. And because of that, it just makes them really versatile um, and it makes them really effective. It means that you can put them anywhere. You can transport them to any part of the world where you've got crops or you need flowers that, that need um, pollinating. And, and these insects can, can do that pollination for you. And the key thing, they create honey. Honey is a fantastic nutritional resource sugars are extremely rare in nature and um, they're hard to find so when a, a creature can produce sugars on on this level um it makes it extremely attractive not just for humans but for other wildlife you know loads and loads of other animals love honey and they'd love to get their hands on it and it's because of its production of honey uh, that's made this creature so famous and and so widely loved um but not only that they have an immensely sophisticated um, social structure, their, their entire 
ecology, their behavior, the way that they, they work together is incredibly, uh, it's just amazing. And um, we know really nothing like it in the animal kingdom other than in human societies, a little bit ants uh, and termites too. And um, it's something called a eusociality. These, uh, these autom autonomous independent animals all sort of work together um, to rear offspring, to look after the young, which they are related to. Um, and you will have a queen and she will have many sisters and the sisters will do the, the offspring rearing um, and the queen will do the egg laying. And like I said, 80,000 individuals in a single in a single hive, that's a lot of egg laying, that's one poor mother, um, mother bee. So uh, one of the other interesting things that, that people often notice about honeybees is that they have these hexagonal shaped cones um, and recent research has explained why honeybees have hexagonal shaped cones, um, and it's called the honeycomb conjecture. Um, and what this basically says is, it, this, this theory basically says is that, that if you were to have different shapes in a honeycomb, which shapes are the most efficient at absorbing the most amount of honey, but for creating the biggest surface area for you to, to have honey? Well, if you have lots of concentric circles next to each other, then what you what you tend to get is little triangles, little gaps in between, which means that you, you're not sort of utilizing space efficiently. But if you use uh, hexagonal cells, then you have this really nice effect where all the sort of cells line up nice and neatly. You're maximizing the amount of space that you can have where you can then store your the, the floral oils, which will later dry to become honey. Um, and I thought this was really interesting. It just shows, you know, we've been studying bees for thousands of years, and yet we're only recently actually starting to answer some of the questions that we've had um, in, in, in previous times. So it's a really exciting time to be looking at these. It's a really exciting time to be looking at, at, at insects in general and most wildlife because we can apply modern technology um, to age old questions and it can really help us uh, make progress in our understanding of these creatures. Um, but yeah, honeybees are a fantastic species, but I probably won't be speaking about them again um, for the rest of this presentation because they get a lot of attention uh, anyway. And I wanna focus on another group, which is the solitary bees. So, like I said before, they're not social, they're solitary, they don't live in hives, they do live in nests, um, but in, in a nest, it's usually a mother bee and about five or six offspring. It really depends on the flowers that she has around her, the amount of food that she's able to rear, in the same way that it would depend, uh, the, the, the number of uh, chicks that a blue tit would be able to, to rear is dependent on the number of caterpillars and food resources and nesting space in, in an available area. Um, but yeah, there's 250 species of solitary bee in, in the UK, um, and what I found quite, quite fascinating is that in Birmingham and the Black Country alone, it's quite, quite a small area when you think about it, we've had 139 species of bee recorded over the past century. Uh, and we have a really good um, approach to, to studying bees in this area. So for many, many years, uh, researchers, professional researchers, all the way down to volunteers and members of the public have submitted records about wildlife. <clears throat> and you often, if you're a person that does submit records, you're probably thinking, where do, the, where do those records go? Well, it goes towards this analysis that helps us build these pictures of how these animals use this, this landscape. And that's really important, particularly right now, because we're trying to understand sort of nature recovery networks. We're trying to look at connectivity between wildlife. We want to look at corridors. How can we support our land, our, the wildlife in our landscapes better? Well, the, the best way of doing it is restoring habitats protecting what we already have and linking up areas where we know existing populations are. And so understanding um, these species, understanding the way they interact with our, our, our landscape in this area is, is really important and really interesting as well. Uh, and these are quite interesting looking creatures too. Um, so some of them really look quite really cute and cuddly and fluffy. You, you'll probably see it and you think, oh, that looks like a bee. Others like this guy over here, don't look like bees at all. They look like wasps. They look like some strange alien creatures. And um, they're my favorite. Uh, because they just look so weird and wonderful and when people see them they just it blows their mind and we'll talk a little bit more about those that group of bees uh, a little bit later and um, but the first one I'm, the, the big group i want to talk about is the mining bees so mining bees are the largest group of bees in the uk they're part of a group called the andrina uh, in a family called the andrenidae don't worry about the latin terms they're just there um, in case you, you're interested um but they are probably our most important group of bees in terms of ecosystem services um, and by ecosystem services, I mean, what, what do they provide to the ecosystem? How do they support ecology in our area? Um, well, what they do is they love to nest on the ground. They're what we call the ground nesters. They're fossorial species and they burrow into soils and sands. And that's where they actually put their eggs. And um, so some of them like to nest in vertical faces where they'll put them sort of 
they'll, they'll nest that way. Others like to go uh, into horizontal surfaces directly into the ground. Uh, interesting that sandy footpaths on, on, on parks, so if you go to certain park, for example, and you have a little walk around the sandy footpaths there, you'll see tons and tons of bees. Um, but they love to nest on the ground and they put their, their nests all quite a way down, about a metre down. I've got a little diagram later, I'll kind of show you about that. Um, and they, like I said, different species will have different um, nesting preferences. Some will like to nest in sort of free draining sandy soils, others quite like sort of muddy, soily soils. Soily soils. Um, and they, yeah, they're very varied, but they're really interesting because when they move into an area, they terraform that area. So they change that habitat in order to suit their own needs, something that humans do as well, as well as other insects like mayflies. Um, and what this does is it, it creates more wild, creates more biodiversity in doing so because they're creating a habitat. And in, in that habitat, they'll attract other insects, they'll attract other wildlife, and that will attract more and other wildlife. So where you have this group, you have a richer, sort of more stable ecosystem that follows. Um, this, this species here, sorry, just to go back, this is at uh, Andrewinitino area, the ashy mining bee. It's a really, really common bee in Bone Black Country. They often call it the dandelion bee because it loves to sit on dandelions. It's a good um, early spring emerging species, and it's very easily identifiable because it's it's sort of this ashy colour. It's this grey, almost blue, bluey, purpley colour. It's a really beautiful bee, and they nest all at once. Um, so it's a really good bee to look out for in this area. This species is Andrina um, fulva, uh, the thorny mining bee. And this is a fantastic species. I, I, I don't think this species gets enough credit because if, if I was to ask you of, a, of an animal in the UK, other than a fox that is bright orange, a lot of people I think would struggle to come up with, with something that you could probably find in your back garden. And the tawny mining bee um, is a stunning insect. It's again, it's a very early spring emerging species. And what's fantastic about this is that it, you can find it in your garden. Um, if you live in Bowman Black Country in particular, I, I know for a fact, because I've been to many different gardens in the area and I've been to lots of different green spaces, this is probably the most common bee I come across when I'm doing surveys. Um, and it's so unmistakable, so characteristic. It have this beautiful orange uh, body, lots of bright orange hair. Uh, the females tend to be a bit fatter and larger than the males. Um, often in the bee world, um, the males tend to be kind of skinny and scrawny and, and look a bit disheveled. And the females tend to be sort of large and plump and pretty and hardworking and, and sort of do all the all the important eco ecological behaviour. Um, but these guys uh, like or girls, they like to nest underground. Um, it is important to know, actually, um, in case I, I get confused people, only female bees make nests. Male bees aren't involved in nest creation. Um, and only female bees pollinate. Sometimes male bees might sit on flowers to drink nectar and they might get a bit of pollen on them, but in, in the grand scheme of things, it's the females that do all the pollination. And that's why the females tend to be larger, plumper and prettier, because they've got more hair, they've got more apparatus, if you like, for carrying pollen. But Andrea um, Fulver, you'll, you'll find these little sort of volcano-like mounds in your garden in, in early spring. And if you see these, then I'm really jealous because I'm very, you're very lucky. Um, because it means that you've got Andrina's nesting in your garden. Um, people often get scared. They think that they're gonna damage their lawn. Um, they're afraid to mow their lawn, all these kinds of things. What I've often found is, is if you just leave them alone, then they'll be gone in, in about two weeks and you won't have to worry about them again for another year. Um, but really try to enjoy them because they're beautiful animals. Um, please record them if you see them um, and just watch them because they, they really are Quite, quite remarkable creatures, the way that they create lots of different nests. And often when you have one nest, you'll have a network of nests as well. Um, they're quite gre gregarious nesters, uh, but fantastic species and a really, really important one to look out for. This is what the female looks like, as you can see, quite big, bright orange. Uh, and this is a male. Uh, and the male, <clears throat> again, you can see it's a little bit scrawnier, a little bit skinnier. Um, it also has longer antennae. So males have 13 segments there on antennae, whereas females have 12. It's a very, very tiny difference. Um, it's, sometimes it's hard to see even with a microscope, but you can tend, sometimes you can tell because they tend, the males tend to be a bit more crazier. They just sort of go a bit wild all over the place. Um, but another key feature that can often help you identify males from females, and people often find this quite funny, is that males tend to have a little white moustache. Um, you can see this little, this little critter here. So it, it just tends to be a sort of white, fluffiness around their face uh, and it does 
in a weird way, I don't know if it's like a written rule of entomology or anything, but 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 males tend to have this almost like a little white moustache, and it's a good way of being able to help help you identify them. Um, but yeah, great great species to look out for in spring. Um, and this is the kind of these are the kind of tunnels that they create. So, um, when I say they nest underground, I mean they they nest deep underground sometimes. So this is sometimes they can go up to ten centimeters. I know that there are species that can go up to about a meter underground. But what they'll do is they'll they'll have this main burrow, as you can see here, uh, where my mouse is. That goes down vertically into the ground, and then they have what we call lateral tunnels that, that sort of come off. And these are like side branches, if you imagine like a main branch of a tree. And at the end of this lateral tunnel, you'll have a nesting cell. And inside the nesting cell, that's where there'll be an egg, which will develop into a larvae. The larvae will feed on pollen the mother bee has provided, and it will grow into an adult after a stage of pupation. And um, so there's four stages in the life cycle of a bee, all the way up egg, um, larvae, pupae, and then uh, an adult bee. And then what, what the adult will do is it will dig right up to the surface, it will go out the main lateral tunnel and fly off and it will go start its own nesting cells, nesting place somewhere else. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really quite interesting in terms of bone in the black country because of the fact they like to nest in bare earth. Bare earth is a habitat um, and it's a habitat that is extremely rare. It's on, it's often built on or developed on, it's lost, but it's really good for lots of invertebrates particularly beetles uh, and, and mining bees. Um, and so this is Andrina cinerary. You can see that it's just flying in and outside of its nesting hole. Nice when you can see the little um, tail there. But they, yeah, they're, they're very effective flies and they, they fly out of their nesting holes really, really quickly. So if you ever want to see them, the best thing to do is if you find a nesting hole, it tends to be on a sort of south facing sunny side uh, of a bank or, or a piece of, of dead wood. Um, if you if you stay there, wait for them to come back to the nesting hole because as they come back in, they sort of slow down and then you can get really good photographs of them sort of going inside. Um, but like I said, these are fantastic ecosystem engineers. And when you have these bees, you'll often get other related bees. So, Aaron, there was just a question for you before you move yeah. on, if that's all right. So Anthony's yeah, just posted a message in the chat to ask, how do bees get all the pollen off their bodies once they return back to their, back to their nesting sites? That's a good question. Um, sometimes with great difficulty, um, you'll often find bees that are covered in pollen and they can't get, can't actually get it off. Um, so that they have these, these hairs called scopa. In fact, this next slide shows this very well. So there's this feature here on, on the hind leg is called a scopa or a pollen brush. These are thin hairs lots and lots of thin branched hairs um, that are able to collect the pollen. Um, interestingly, slight side note, but the hairs are a diff that they're positively charged and the pollen is negatively charged. And so the pollen literally jumps onto the hairs of the bee. So this is something that scientists have recently uh, discovered. But what they will usually do is when they come back to a nest, they will sort of they'll use their hands to scrape hands, they'll use their <laughs> uh, claws, if you like, to scrape the pollen off the brush into, into their nesting cell, but they, they do struggle. Um, and if they get the pollen on parts of their body, like on the top of their thorax, for example, on their, on their back, then they probably won't get it off. Um, and it just sort of stays on them. But actually you don't want all the pollen to come off the bee because the whole process of pollination is, is based upon some of this pollen scattering and falling off a bee as it's flying, because then it falls on a plant and then plant is able to reproduce. So yeah, with great difficulties is the answer to that question. Thank you, Aaron. No problem. Um, so like I was saying, so the, the larger mining bees, they create habitats and in those habitats, you get smaller mining bees and these are called mini miners and these are beautiful. Um, I was really shocked to find that A, there's about six species of these in the United Kingdom and B, we get three of these species in Birmingham Black Country and they are absolutely tiny. So these are the, the fingertips of Stephen Forth, who's a really notable entomologist in the UK. Um, and he's holding uh, this, this tiny mini miner in, in his fingers um, because they are literally that small. But even though they are that small, they are still really effective pollinators and they can get inside tiny, tiny flower heads that other bees can't. And you might come across a flower and you might think, how, how on earth does anything get inside that to, to pollinate? What pollinates that flower? Well, it's tiny insects that you can't see um, unless you really go out and look for them, whether you, unless you're trained to, to know what to look for. But these guys can be found on flowers um, and they're very, very small. They look like little flies, but if you look for the segmented antennae, 
if you look for the compound eyes, if you look for the, the, the four width, the four individual wings, then you know you're looking at a, a bee, you're looking at a hymenopteran. Um, and they're, they're beautiful, really fantastic um, creatures. Um, and like I said, we get about three in the UK. They're very difficult to differentiate. Um, and I wouldn't suggest someone starting out tries to look for these. Um, but yeah, really fascinating little creatures. Um, so one of the, the great things about mining bees is they love to nest in these, these sort of soil, sandy soils. And, and if you are interested in creating nesting habitats for these creatures, then you could often you could always build yourself a bee bank. So a bee bank is a south facing sandy sort of sloped substrate um, off made of soil and sands and, and gravels and bits of stones and things like that. Um, and literally all you do is you keep it bare of vegetation uh, throughout the year. And you keep it so that it, it's facing in a southerly or southwesterly position, so it's sort of getting a lot of sunshine throughout the day. And I guarantee it, if you just leave it and watch it, you'll get nesting holes in it within a couple of months, but often weeks, depending on where you are. And um, it will get a lot of use. These habitats are becoming increasingly rare in our area because so much of our area is developed or built upon. Um, and that means that the nesting insects inside, um, inside, inside banks that are already existing often get knocked down uh, because you know because planning and developers have to, have to build structures um, but if you can if there's anything that you want to do in your garden if there's something that's really simple that you can do in your garden that can really help bees it's create bare earth create a little patch of bare earth um, you can always plant wildflowers as well but bare earth is a really brilliant habitat and it allows you to study bees in a way that other, other things other ways won't and um, I think that it, this is one of the rarest habitats that probably have in Europe. Um, it's often not mapped as well, bear us, and that's a problem. We don't actually know how much there is. Um, sites like heathlands are really fantastic for this because they tend to be large landscapes, got lots, lots of sandy free draining soils, which stay bare throughout the year. You have pockets and sporadic bits of um, gorse and heather that sort of scatter around the landscape. But uh, for the most part, they stay, they stay bare and they provide a perfect habitat for these insects. Ask a question, Aaron. Is that all right? Yeah, of course. Um, so, if um, if anybody listening tonight wanted to um, make a bee bank, so obviously I'm I'm aware that you've created them for the for the for us uh, um, on some of our on some of our sites, and like many of our um, uh, participants this evening, I've got a, you know a fairly wildlife friendly garden. How um, how simple is it to make? What kind of what kind of is it just is it just regular building sand? Is there a particular type of sand? How big does it need to be? Etc. Is there any maintenance? Could you give a couple of tips? Yeah, absolutely. These are, again, it's, it's very experimental. Um, often what you create will attract something anyway, if you're making it out of natural resources. But uh, your classic stereotypical bee bank is really easy to make. All you need is um, builder sand um, and you need to sort of mix, say, two cups or two portions of builder sand with a bit of topsoil. The sandier the substrate, the better. But what you want is to sort of create a level of compaction that means that when you put it up against the wall or you put it in your garden, it doesn't all just fall down into one big sand pit. And um, so the, you can you can add a bit of sand and in order to help with that, you can add some stones. So you can get like a bag of gravel, standard sort of small pebble sized gravel, and you can chuck that in and that kind of helps the habitat to retain some structural integrity, but it also helps the habitat to heat up because stones absorb solar radiation from the sun. So yeah, you just need a corner of your garden that gets a lot of sunlight. You want to build it, um, maybe a quarter of a meter off the ground, uh, but it really depends on how much space you have. Um, and you can create sloped ones, you can create vertical ones. You can really just play around with the sand as best you possibly can to create some kind of structure. Um, and what you'll find is that vegetation will try to take over. You wanna keep the, the, the substrate free of vegetation um, and really just yeah, leave it and, and, and let, it, let it do its own thing. Naturally, it will form a habitat. And like I was saying earlier about how rare bare earth is that's why when you put it in your garden you will immediately get visitors we tend to immediately get visitors because it's such a rare habitat and um, if anyone wants more tips about this then um they can feel free to email me and i can, I can give them sort of more specific guidance um but yeah really really simple thing that you can make and it could be a really effective habitat that's great thank you Aaron. i've always wanted to ask that thank you all right um, yeah, so the next group of bees I wanted to chat to you about are the nomads, uh, and these are what we call cleptoparasites, and I find these absolutely fascinating. So these are cuckoo bees. Um, they basically do exactly what a cuckoo bird would do. They, they sneak into another bee's nest, and they lay their own eggs. 
And what these guys will actually do is they'll, they'll destroy the other bees' eggs as well. And then they'll, they'll come out. And the, the host bee will then rear this bee's offspring, if that makes sense. And they don't look like bees. They look like wasps. And uh, the reason that is, is because they're really closely related to wasps. But if, if you think about it, evolutionarily, they, they are sort of more, more like wasps than they are bees. They don't need to collect any pollen because they're, they're, used, they're putting their eggs in another bee's nest, which has collected pollen. So they have, they're, they're kleptoparasitizing a pollinating bee's nest. And because they don't collect pollen, they don't need hair. They don't need anywhere near as much hair as, as your, another bee would, as your sort of uh, tawny mining bee, for example. And so they tend to look quite hairless. And um, they also look a little bit like wasps. They sort of resemble wasps with these sort of yellow um, and black stripes in their abdomen. And that's a mimicry that they're, they're sort of form of mimicry that they, which they're using to uh, prevent other animals from attacking them. Um, and they're, they're quite sleek and slim. And they, they, what's really fascinating about these animals is that they use scent to find uh, the hosts, the, the, the bees that they, they're going to predate. Um, they use a lot of scent mimicry as well. So they'll, they'll use chemicals that they produce to trick other bees into thinking that they're not a threat. Um, and they can smell out their host as well. And what you'll find in early spring, and it's amazing how often, often this happens in a garden. Um, so you'll have your, your pollinating bees flying around, doing their thing, sitting on flowers, and then directly behind them, right, and I mean literally right behind them, you will have nomad bees. You'll have their kleptoparasites slowly and closely following their trail. Um, and often if you catch, you can be sweeping, you know, if you're weird like me and you go out and catch a lot of insects in a net, you can often catch them both together. You can get the species and the kleptoparasite. And that's really great because it shows that the population of the host bee is strong enough, is healthy enough to have a kleptoparasite, to have a cuckoo. Cuckoos aren't bad things, they're needed. They are the apex predators, if you like, of the insect world. They control the population, they restore balance to the ecosystem, and they make sure that no one species or no one group um, outcompetes any other. Um, and I really love them because they look cool and they look a bit weird as well. And like I said, just so they look like wasps. So in early spring, if you look really closely uh, in around your garden, you might find these these creatures here, not, not the cuckoo, um, but the, the nomad bee. And like I said, they look like wasps. So they have this yellow and black stripe on their abdomen. They sometimes have these little yellow spots that almost looks like a little face. And we call these little scutella spots. Um, and sometimes they have little yellow shoulder pads too. Um, but they're quite brightly colored insects. They also have orange, some, sometimes they have orange and red antennae. Um, and they have quite orange gangly legs. And when they fly, their legs sort of are lower down, the, the legs sort of dangle beneath them. Looks really strange. Um, you'll probably spot it and think that's weird what, what's going on there and you'll realize it's a nomad bee um, and they're actually they're the joint second largest group of bees in the UK I think it's about 33 species um, and a quarter of all bees um, in the UK are cuckoos so they're really important they're a huge proportion of our ecosystem they're a huge sorry a huge portion of our bee fauna and um, but they're yeah, very brightly colored very weirdly colored um, and some of them are, in fact most of them are very under recorded and that goes for pretty much all bees um, that they're under recorded insects. So go out this spring, have a little look around the sort of bases of your plants, where you see a, a mining bee, have a little look closely behind. Have you got little little sequences of, of nomad bees, what we call kleptoparasites, chasing them. And the reason they're called kleptoparasites is because uh, of the word kleptomania, because of uh, someone who has a sort of obsession with stealing, because these guys go in and they sort of steal the nesting cells of, of other bees. Um, and yeah, so they're associated with dry sandy soils. Um, most of them are ground nesting. The reason that most of them are ground nesting is because the nomads or the nomada, they tend to attack mining bees. Uh, and most mining bees, pretty much all 69 slash 70 species of mining bee in the UK are ground nesting. And um, so that's why you have this close association. Um, and like I said before, they use scent to confuse and, and sort of intimidate their hosts. And they're brightly coloured. Um, so they're really easily identifiable. Um, I really like these species because when I first started looking for bees in my local area, it is difficult to identify many groups, but these ones you can go straight away because that's the name of bee. 
It's definitely not a wasp, even though it looks like a wasp, it's a bee trying to look like a wasp. Uh, the other group I want to talk to you about are the furrow bees, and this is the other joint second largest group of bees we have in the UK. Um, it's a massive, massive group throughout the world as well. Um, so they're in a family called the Helictidae. Uh, within this family, the Helictidae, there's two groups. There's the Helictids and there's the Laziobossum. Again, don't worry about Latin terms, it's just there if you ever want to learn them. Uh, but we call this group collectively the furrow bees. And the reason they're called the furrow bees is because the females of all of, the, all of these species have what we call a rema on the tip of their abdomen. And a rema is a furrow. It's a vertical groove that goes down. I'm not entirely sure why bees have this feature. Um, I'm not actually sure if it's well understood um, at all, uh, but they do. And um, it's a feature that enables you to help nicely identify them in the field. So you can actually identify them to, to genus level in the field without much practice or training. You're looking for this vertical groove. What's great about these bees as well, they, they sort of come out in a succession. All bees, they, they emerge in a succession over the course of a, of a year. Succession is just a fancy word of way of saying pattern, um, a seasonal pattern, if you like. So in early spring, you'll get the mining bees, the andrinas. Um, you'll also get things like the hairy-footed flower bees. You'll get the early bumblebees. As you move into summer, you tend to get species, the, the furrow bees, um, and sort of more summer plant loving species and then as they sort of die out they're only around for maybe a month or so then you'll get another group of bees that take over so there's always this pattern of bee phenology if you like um throughout the uk and it can it can be a useful way of, of helping you to identify them so for example if you're looking in really early spring and you see a a, a furrow bee then you'll probably be like actually that's probably not a furrow bee because it's early spring and they're, they're more of a summer emerging species but yeah they're large they can be quite robust the helictids can be quite robust, very brightly coloured. Um, and yeah, what, one of the things I really love about furrow bees is a, is a group called the Laziogossum. Uh, these, this is a genus within, within that group. So the Laziogossum are a group of species uh, that are metallic. Um, and they, they are metallic all over the world, but in Birmingham in the Black Country, you get these bright green, tiny, shiny little bees. Um, and they can be find, found literally anywhere. You can find them on roadside verges in your garden. Um, I think there's about three species that are green and metallic, and one of those is really under-recorded. Um, but you can see here that the, the, the beautiful colours of, of these creatures, when they're photographed, it really brings, brings them out. And they're absolutely tiny as well. Um, so they can be very easily missed, and they can even be considered to be flies, and so people ignore them. And you get different metallic colourations. So you can get green. I think green is probably the most most common one, but you can also get bronze colored bees as well. Um, and the most, be most beautiful thing I find about premature all insects, including bees and beetles and flies and everything else, is that when you're looking at them on flowers, if you catch them in the light in the right way, then they glisten. They literally look like little jewels on flowers. Um, and they are so integral to our ecosystem. They are the foundation of pretty much all life on earth. And um, it's, it's just nice to be able to see them in that way as, as like, you know, little precious jewels, which they, which they really are. So that, that's just a little bit about the species diversity bees that we have uh, in this area. There are many, many more, but I can't go into uh, too much detail. Those will be here all day. Uh, but the next thing I want to chat to you about is why Birmingham and Black Country? What, what is it about this area that's so special for, for insects? Why is it that I'm talking to you about bees in Birmingham and Black Country? It's not really an area you would initially expect to find huge populations of bees. But uh, you'd be you'd be wrong. So interestingly, urban areas tend to support high populations of insects. This is something that's being studied more and more recently, often been studied at the University of Reading as well as the, at the University of Birmingham. But there's something interesting about an urban area in that it's a collection of mosaic habitats. You have this diversity of, of, of landscape and habitat uses all in this small area. And what that does is it creates a lot of opportunity for wildlife to move in and to live in, live in that area. Uh, so the population of Birmingham and Black Country is pretty pretty high. It's about 1,370,000, sorry, not 1,000. Um, and it's one of the most heavily urbanized and developed areas in the UK. Um, and anyone who lives in the area will, will know that. And this is a really, really sort of urban, developed area. 
Having said that, though, we have a huge number of bee species, um, and that's because of the diversity of habitats that we have in this area. Um, and I'll come to that in a second on the next slide. So one of the key things about Birmingham Black Country is that we have bare earth. And I know I've been banging on about bare earth uh, all evening, but it is a really important habitat. And because we have this history of land use change in this area, you know, there's a lot of development. There's a lot of habitats that get moved and new ones get built. Buildings get uh, burnt down and new ones get uh, created and green spaces get cleared and new green spaces take over. There's this huge interchanging uh, sort of play that happens uh, in this area. And then what happens then is you get a, a, a sort of subsequent consequence for the wildlife that lives there. And it just so happens that bees actually tend to do quite well because of this, because of all this land use change, because of the sort of intermixing of, of, of all these different sort of soil types and, and landscape uses. So bare earth patches are really important in Burma and Black Country. We have a really rich history of mining in this area. Um, anyone who, who's from the Black Country particularly will know that. Um, and because of that, we have lots of disturbed soil. And that's good for two reasons. The first is quite obvious in that you're creating nesting space for insects. You know, you're actually creating patches of bare earth where insects can, can live and nest. But the other key thing is that when you get disturbed uh, soils, where you get sort of disturbed bare earth, you get really interesting plant populations forming. And bees are only really as, as healthy as the plants that surround them. Um, if you have a good, rich and diverse uh, range of plant species in an area, then you'll have a good, rich, diverse range of bees. And in Birmingham Black Country, we've had so much land use change. We've had all these, all this landscape, all this soil move back and forth and changed around. And that's disturbed the seed bank underneath the soil. And it means that in different areas of the landscape where you have different topographies, you'll get uh, and different shapes and different dips and things like that, you'll get interesting plant communities popping up. And it's through those plant communities that we have interesting insect populations. So, um, and I'll come back to that in a second, um, but just to carry on with the, with the concept of mining. Uh, so the black country has been, the landscape has been sort of tilled, it's been, it's been excavated. Um, and particularly in areas like, for example, in Warsaw, uh, where we've had you know huge huge amounts of mining over the last years, we have lots of these brownfield sites, um, and in these brownfield sites you have the disturbed soil that provides all these lovely south-facing sunny banks for insects to nest in. Um, and so, for example, the heathlands in in the black black country area, they're fantastic for pollinators because of this, because the landscape has been um, sort of excavated, then it's sort of been abandoned, wildlife has been has taken over. And these, these landscapes have then sort of restored themselves to a sort of natural, um, healthy uh, and stable environment. Um, but it's because of this, because of this disturbed soil that we have interesting species of mining bee, nomad bee, and, and many, many more. Um, just trying to find, yeah. So I, saw, I spoke a little bit about wildflowers. Um, did you know, for example, that in Birmingham Black Country, we have 43% of all the plants that have been recorded in the whole of Great Britain, in this tiny, tiny area. And that's reflected in the number of bee species we have as well. So we, so we have almost half the number of plants in the whole of the UK found just in our area. And we also all, almost have half the number of bees found in the UK just in our area. So you can sort of see here this pattern between wildflowers and, and bee species. Um, but it's not just the, the, the disturbed sea banks that we have in this area that are really important. It's also the fact that we have urban wildflowers. So we have lots of people that do have gardens in urban areas. We have loads of those in these gardens, right, backing off onto one another. Um, and inside these gardens, you often have an interesting collection of plants. You'll often have um, species that, that flower at different times of the year, which enables um, bees to feed at different times of the year. Sometimes as well, you may also have non-native plants. Now, I'm not advocating the use of non-native plants. We should use native plants where we can, but non-native plants do help sometimes fill in the foraging gap um, when, when bee species and pollinators are looking for food. Often you'll have, because we've had such huge losses to wildflowers uh, throughout the UK over the last 50, 60 years, um, it means that we, we have these gaps where there's no nothing flowering in an area, um, at a time when bees are out foraging, and so they're forced to feed on 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 uh, non-native species. But yeah, surprisingly, urban areas can be extremely diverse florally, 
um, and gardens can are the, some of the best places for actually supporting insect populations. And I actually think I read a paper not that long ago that looked at bumblebee nests in agricultural areas and in urban areas. And what they found was that the there were more bumblebee nests in urban areas than there were in rural ones. So we often think of the British countryside as being this incredibly ecologically rich environment um, where you know the sort of true wild of, of the of, of the UK is. It's not necessarily true because of the damage that we have brought to our, our countryside um, through agriculture and, and uh, urban intensification. We've caused massive damages to, to those populations there. And a lot of them actually fled into cities because those are areas where they can survive because they get food, they get shelter. They also get something called the urban heat island effect. So in an urban area, you get hotter temperatures, average temperatures compared to surrounding environment because you have buildings that reflect sunlight and trap heat. Mm -hmm. um, it's often also why they think they, we might be getting more parakeets in urban areas as opposed to, to rural ones. But yeah, urban areas are incredibly rich because of the floral diversity that they provide. Um, and yeah, garden flowers, they provide lo lots of um, native and non-native um, pollen and nectar sources throughout the course of a changing year. Um, there's some interesting plants that you can you can grow for um, many different species of bee. Um, one of my favorites is fleabane, a really in interesting plant because you, it doesn't just attract bees, but attracts um, hoverflies, butterflies, you get them all feeding on the same plant. Um, there's tons of plants out there and, and you can tend to quite easily find which species would be best for pollinators that you want to attract um, online or um, on different websites. Um, Um, yeah, and so this is just the fact as I was going to say, I've already mentioned, there's 43% of all the plant species recorded from the whole of Great Britain have been found just in this little tiny urban area. It's really quite fascinating. Um, it's probably, it probably explains a lot about why we have such a diverse area in terms of wildlife. Um, and it really reflects the diversity of habitats that we have in our local area. And it's something that we should really champion and talk about more because, it, you know, it's something that we should be proud of that in, in Birmingham Black Country, we have really rich um, ecosystem. Um, it's often not, not looked at properly. It's often sort of um, neglected or, or considered to be poorer to, compared to other regions of the UK. But actually, I think we should really champion what we have here because it's quite, it's quite remarkable. Um, and the other reason that brown, um, urban areas are really important because brownfield sites. So, a brownfield site um, is just of any area of land that's sort of been abandoned, it's been developed on and it's sort of not really used anymore. Um, and they look kind of terrible, don't they? They look a little bit neglected. They look like there's nothing really going on there. Um, but actually, these are absolutely fantastic areas for bees. Some of the best um, sites in the country, I think actually the best site in the country for any for, for insects is a brownfield site. Um, and in Birmingham, the backcountry as well, the best sites, most, most of our nature reserves, uh, wildlife trust nature reserves, um, and the sites that we manage and look after in our area are brownfield sites because they really support a rich diversity of wildlife. And the reason is because you have, it's almost like a heathland mosaic landscape forming where you have patches of bare earth interspersed with interesting plants that are growing because you know, the seeds have been disturbed there. And they're sort of sporadically um, spread out across the landscape. And because you've got this, this excavation and, and the, the disturbance of the seed bank, you'll get plants popping up at different times of year. So bees can move from one plant to another plant to another plant. There's plenty of nesting sites um, because the soil is bare. It's, it's easily um, burrowed into. Um, and yeah, they, they tend to naturally regenerate themselves. If you just leave these areas, that's one of the most beautiful things about nature. If you just leave it be, if you just allow it to do balance and equilibrium and um, brownfield sites really demonstrate that we've had a lot of mining a lot of destruction to our environment particularly in the moment the black country but what's really nice to see is that from that destruction and um, from the sort of um, ecological harm that's been caused from that over time those areas um, naturally regenerate often with a bit of help in hand from volunteers and and, and the wildlife trust and um, but also just naturally because the, the sort of ecosystem will heal itself. Uh, and the, the first place that starts is with the insect plant interactions and how that community develops from the ground up. Um, and yeah, they have impressive wildflowers in uh, early spring and summer. 
And things like knapweeds, trefoils, many of the nectar rich plants uh, will grow really, really well in these areas. Um, and knapweeds, knapweeds are great, they're sort of a summer flowering plant because they tend to get like a lot of leaf leafcutter bees that will sit on top of them, they'll, they'll rub their bum in, into the flowers and they'll collect pollen. But trefoils are, are probably my favourite. And the reason is, is because um, they are, they, they have nitrogen fixing bacteria in their root nodules. Um, a lot of plants have these, they're called legumes. And um, what that allows them to do is it, it allows them to take in nitrogen from the atmosphere. It means that the plant can grow more healthily. And it often means that the, the products that the plant produces, whether it's the, the nuts or the fruits or the, the floral oils or the nectar or the pollen, it tends to be much richer in protein. Um, and it's the same for us humans. You know, we like our peas, we like our beans because they're nutritious. And um, it's the exact same for the pollinators themselves. They like the plants that produce those fruits and vegetables, vegetables um, because they, um, they're high, highly nutritious um, and they, they make for a healthier um, and more stable um, lifestyle. So here's just a few bees that you'll get in urban areas that you might not be aware of. Um, and this is one of my favorites. Again, you'll notice that my favorite bees tend to be the ones that are easily identified. And that's because of the fact that when you're starting out, there's no better feeling than you know, being able to accurately say that is that species. And um, because you'll get you'll get a lot, you'll get a lot wrong. If you if you go into the world of recording, um, it's absolutely normal and it's it's you know it, it's okay to get things wrong. Um, and it's it's part of the process of learning. Um, but yeah, so these are the yellow face bees. They're part of a genus called the Hylaeus, um, and they're quite interesting. They tend not to look like bees, and that's a theme that you've probably picked up throughout this presentation. The bees can look not like bees. And these insects are great because they have these bright yellow facial markings, um, and it allows you to easily identify them. And these uh, aren't ground nesting bees at all. So these are actually aerial or form cavity nesting bees. There tends to be a fair few number of cavity nesting species in any area, although the, the largest group are the, the ground nesters. Cavity nesters, they like to make their nests in pre-existing holes made by other animals. So this could be holes drilled into wood by humans. It could be uh, holes made by beetles when they're sort of digging, trying to get into, into a tree so they can lay their own eggs. Um, it could be holes cracked into the side of an oak tree or a beech tree by uh, a woodpecker. Basically, anywhere where there is a pre-existing cavity, it can even be a, a deck chair, a hole in the deck chair. I've, I've heard a story of someone who went on a holiday and had um, a newspaper stuffed through their front door, through their letterbox, and obviously it didn't get collected over some whilst they're on holiday. And when they came back, there were leaf cutter bees nesting inside the cavity, the, the scrunched up hole that the that the newspaper provided. Um, and they are really versatile like that, and that's how they survive. Um, but these guys, they tend to be wood nesters. What's really weird about these bees as well, is they're quite primitive. So they don't, as you can see, if you're looking at this guy now, um, and this is a male on the right hand side here, um, they, they tend to be quite hairless. For, and this is, a, it's not a kleptoparasite, so it's not a cuckoo bee, it's an actual bee. It does visit, it's a, poll it's a pollinating bee, if you like. Um, and it tends it's quite hairless and it's quite interesting that it, that it is it does have a little bit of pollen on it but it's really not not what you'd expect for a bee and the reason is these bees they don't collect pollen like other bees instead they eat their pollen and they drink their nectar and they keep it in a crop in their stomach and they fly back to their nest and they get inside their nesting cell and then they sick all of this pollen and nectar up onto the grub which is at the bottom Sounds disgusting, but it's just a nice, smooth, liquidy meal for the larvae to, to slurp up quite easily. Um, why do they do this? Well, we're not entirely sure. It could be that these bees represent a stage in the evolution of bees where you go from having species, where you go from wasps, which don't collect pollen at all. They will tend not to, they go out and they collect animal prey like flies. But sometimes they'll bring a bit of pollen back on the fly. And it might have been that that's how pollen got um, inserted into, into the sort of lifestyle of a bee and wasp. So these guys, they, they don't collect it in, in the sort of traditional classic sense, um, but they probably represent 
a group of bees that have existed for many, many millennia and that evolved at the same time as, as those in, in that period where bees were sort of moving, from, where insects were moving from wasps to bees. Sorry, it's a little bit complicated to explain. But they, yes, yeah, so they, they collect it in, in, a, in, in their cloth and then they carry it back. And because they don't need to carry pollen on their abdomens or on their legs or anywhere, then they don't really have it. So they tend to look sleek. They tend to look quite black. Um, and then it tends to look very, they're very, very small, only a few millimetres. Um, and I'll tell you the best way for identifying these bees is by using a torch. Um, if you've got a bee box in your garden, if you've got a nesting space where you think they are, if you've got anywhere where there's little, little holes where you think there might be something living, you take your sort of, your, a torch or a uh, torch on your phone, if you like, and just shine it over the nesting hole and have a little peek in. What you often see is a little reflection of yellow peeking back at you. And that's the, the hyleus, that's the yellow faced bees hiding inside the hole. And they're absolutely tiny. Very, very commonly recorded in Bowman Black Country. So commonly found, um, not very commonly recorded at all. So please, if you do see them, uh, please record them. And uh, the male yellow faced bee is quite easily identifiable because if you get a good photograph of like, like this, you can often see that the yellow bit of their face sort of hooks around the antennae. And that's how you identify them as the common yellow faced bee. Hyalaeus communis. Um, if the yellow bit doesn't hook around the antennal segment, then it, it won't be that species. But you can see here that it, as it, as it is, it's a male yellow faced bee. The males tend to have lots of yellow on their face. The females tend to have two little segments. It's literally like two little dots there and there. Um, this species here is the hairy yellow faced bee. I did a, a survey of the University of Birmingham campus. Um, it was about two years ago now, I think it was probably during the pandemic and we got permission to go to the campus when there were no students on um, and we did a survey for bees and we found the hairy yellow face bee and it was the first time I'd ever, I'd ever found it and it, it was kind of disappointing in some sense because its, its face wasn't as hairy as, as I thought it would be but one of the things I thought was really interesting is, is the purpleness of the eyes, they have this really interesting uh, these really interesting eyes and they're really beautiful, beautiful uh, insects. So have a look this spring because um, they, they're quite active from uh, early spring all the way up to sort of mid or so early August. Um, and yeah, beautiful insects to, to see in your garden. Another uh, cavity nesting species is a mason bee. And um, this is Osmia. Um, and there's, there's lots of different types of, I said there's lots of different types. There's a few different types of mason bee in the UK, but you're, very, you're only very likely to see the red mason bee and the blue mason bee in Bone and Black Country. So, the red mason bee is um, a very large, red, charismatic um, looking pollinator. It's actually quite famous because a single red mason bee can pollinate as many plants as 120 honeybees. And the reason is the red mason bee is a more effective pollinator. When it flies, the red mason bee will, will spread pollen. It will drop pollen off of its pollen basket. It's not very good at uh, holding onto it. And that's really good for the plants because it means as it flies, the pollen is scattering all over the plants, leading to, to more successful reproduction and, and more successful pollination. Honeybees and bumblebees, they tend to be uh, much sort of more careful when they're carrying the pollen. And you can understand why. They have to go home, they have to feed 80,000 mouths sometimes, or they have to feed a couple of hundred mouths for a bumblebee. So they cannot afford to drop any grains of pollen. So when they fly, they actually keep the pollen in their pollen baskets and all nice and tight, and they tend not to drop any. Um, and that's actually poor for the plants. From the plant's perspective, they want that pollen falling on them because it means that they can reproduce, it means they can create the seeds, which leads to you know, more plants in future. So actually, solitary bees, particularly like mason solitary bees, are really, really effective pollinators. Um, but this species the, the, is the blue mason bee. And, and these are really fantastic creatures. So this is uh, one that my friend Ali got uh, in his garden. Again, I think it was in the pandemic. And it was, uh, the, the pandemic really, if it was an opportunity for anything, it's for people to, to look at wildlife a bit more closely, particularly in their garden and their local area. Um, and I told, I've been telling Ali to, to keep an eye out for things moving into his nest box. And, and they did. And um, he got this beautiful mason bee, blue mason bee, um, Osmia caraculescens, uh, moving in. And um, what I think is most wonderful about this insect is, first of all, the colour of, of, its, of its fur, its hair, but also the colour of its eyes. Um, I don't know any many of the insects that have eyes that are that beautiful, sort of like marbled and, and blue. 
Um, it's a really interesting site. Um, unfortunately, this species isn't very well recorded throughout Bowman Black Country. I've only ever found it once. It was actually the first bee I ever recorded, and it was the it was a first species for a site list, which I was really pleased about. Um, but they're really stunning uh, creatures, and they're very very interesting as well because they collect bits of mud, um, and they use bits of mud, bits of stone, some masonry if you like, and they sort of um, shape these into cocoons. They put their eggs inside with a bit of pollen and nectar and they seal it up and they put another cocoon along, along the sequence. So that's actually quite a common theme with the aerial or cavity nesting species of bee. They create linear nesting cells, which tend to, where they have sort of one, almost like a bedroom, one bedroom, another bedroom, another bedroom, another bedroom. Um, and they can do this in a really sophisticated and clever, clever way. Um, but what's great about these species as well is they're extremely versatile. You put up a nest box uh, in a south facing sunny area and um, you'll tend to get these guys move in um, whether it's a, a red mason bee or a blue mason bee or a, or a hylaeus and um, you, you will get them utilizing that nesting space because unfortunately nesting spaces tend to be rare in the natural world because of the fact that you know we've degraded our environment so much so keep an eye out for these kinds of creatures and if anyone sees these definitely send a record and a photograph into eco record and um, because they're they're very under recorded and but but we have been finding more of them in recent years which may suggest that they're becoming more common and they may end up turning uh, may end up um, coming into your garden uh, or your local green space um in in this season um the other group are the leaf cutter bees so these are probably the ones that you guys are most familiar with um when i think you think of a cavity nesting or aerial nesting species to be so the leaf cutter bees kind of do the exact same thing as a masonry bee except they use leaves and leaf segments and leaf mastic instead of masonry or brickwork or, or mud um, and these are incredibly intelligent and mass amazing amazing animals um they're really voracious in terms of their um, pollination. So if you watch these guys, if you have a little nest box and you watch them, they are flying left and right, collecting pollen, dragging bits of plant material, cutting leaf segments out. They seem to constantly be doing it in the heat of the sun as well. Um, and when they filled up one nesting cell, they'll move to another nesting cell and another nesting cell. So it's great if they've got all the resources that they need in their environment, if they've got lots of plants, if they've got lots of nesting space, it means that they can make many, many offspring. Um, and what's great about leaf cutter bees, I've talked about them being versatile. They're part of a group called the Megachyle. Um, um, and what, what, these, what these guys will do um, is they're, they're, they'll nest basically anywhere. Um, anywhere where the, the nesting conditions are, are suitable, anywhere where the, the habitat is the right temperature, or it's facing in the right direction, so either south or southwesterly, then you will have, have them nesting. So this is a photograph uh, from a friend of mine called Andy Purcell, um, and he was looking at a deck chair in his garden, um, and the photograph doesn't show it too well, but basically this frame looking at um, is, is actually a sort of ceramic deck chair with a little hole in the middle. And what he found was that the leaf cutter bee was making its nest inside, inside that hole, um, living inside the chair, uh, which is quite amazing. Even more amazing, actually, was that a, a, a sharp tail bee, a kleptoparasite, smelt out this leaf cutter bee. Remember how I said that they, they look for scent, they can smell, they can smell their host. It smelt out this leaf cutter bee and parasitized it inside, inside that chair. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on uh, in the insect world, and it's just amazing to be able to, to really see it and study it. But um, yeah, I think there's, uh, there's, there's a fair few species that we get. I think there's about 13 species in the UK. I might be wrong about that. But there's uh, six in, in Birmingham Black Country. Um, and they, yeah, they, they're really commonly spotted from about, um, I'd say, early June onwards. Um, and when they cut these leaf segments, I, I've read that they cut them from 30 different species of, of plant and tree. Um, and what I've often found is that the best, the best tree for them is, is a field maple. Um, field maples have really soft and malleable leaves. Um, and it seems that leaf cutter bees love this because they can sort of tear, tear these pieces out and they can rip them up and, and shape them into little cocoons. Um, and what they do is they create these little, almost like crescent or, or little moons that are being cut out of, of the leaves. Um, 
you do get the Willoughby's leaf cutter bee, which will focus specifically on, on rose bushes. Um, and but literally any plant, any plant that they like, any plant in an area that they, they think is going to be suitable, they will cut, cut these out. So there are seven species known in the UK, not 30. Um, and uh, they cut, yeah, cut, like cutting things out of soft foliage. But I found field maple is a really good plant uh, for that. Um, and I've often found as well, it's great to watch them because it's like watching somebody carrying a, um, a mattress. If you, if you ever picked up a mattress and it's just too big for you and you're sort of walking around with it like that, it's kind of what these guys are doing with, with the leaves. They're flying really fast in, in quite high temperatures um, and, and with, with carrying these big sections of leaf. Um, and they're gregarious, so they'll nest together. Um, and what, uh, another thing that's great as well about leaf cutter bees is that you'll attract kleptoparasites. And kleptoparasites are the thing that we, we want to be recording, we want to see more of. Where you get these bees, you'll get uh, other bees that attack them, and they're you know equally interesting. So uh, thought I'd talk a little bit now about how you can actually help bees in your garden. Just some basic top tips. Um, so the, the key one is is the plant wildflowers. And um, there's a couple of plants on, on this list that I think are really important. Um, I'll start with willow. Um, it's it's important to note that lots of trees actually support insect pollinators and if you think about it as well in early spring you don't really have a lot of wildflowers in flower and um, where you do you get a few species on mass like bluebells they tend to be good at feeding things like bumblebees but when you're talking about solitary species uh, you, you tend not to have a huge diversity of sort of herbaceous plants uh, plants at ground level if you like that provide um, that pollen nectar source trees are really really good at doing this um, particularly species that flower in really early spring, like willow, um, and early flowering fruit trees like crab apple. Um, willow is fantastic though because um, it's one of the earliest to flower, I think, and it has these these wonderful catkins, and these these catkins get absolutely loaded with nectar. They go all sort of white and fluffy, and then they kind of go this like almost like a sort of globular green where you get little sort of globs of, of, of nectar sort of forming on the ends of these the tips of the, the stamens uh, and they become really really rich in nectar and you'll get lots of different animals as you know um, squirrels as well as as um, insects that will try and feed from this nectar and this provides a really important source of pollen and nectar for um for early early rising uh, mining bees, andrinas, which will come, they'll feed off this and they'll go back to their nest. Um, so where you've got willow in flower, uh, it's a really useful plant for solitary bees, species that we don't tend to think about. And then there's also plants like uh, chicory, really, really interesting uh, species that grows. If you want to see a huge sort of aggregation of chicory, um, you can check out RSPB Samuel Valley. They have a huge, sort of, every year they have a huge um, load of chicory that grows through um, the ground. It's like a huge disturbed bank that they have there. And it's a really good um, site for, uh, for pollinators as well, but this plant is fantastic. It grows kind of quite nice, nicely and stately. It's, it's fantastic for bees. You'll get bumblebees, honeybees and solitary bees feeding on it. But not only that, where you have chicory, you also get things like finches and birds that like to feed on the nuts and the, so the seeds that um, develop a little bit later in the season. So it's a really good all-round all plant for wildlife and, and quite a, an interesting one as well. Um, dog rose, so roses, I have a sort of mixed relationship with roses, I guess. Um, I find some roses, although they can be quite beautiful and nice to look at, can be actually really terrible ecologically because they've been bred to look showy and um, where they have lots of florets and, you know, they're quite large and confusing. Um, and this can be really confusing to a pollinator that is trying to get at the nectar, but it can't get at the nectar because the shape of the flower has been manipulated and changed in such a way that it prevents the insect from actually getting inside. Dog rose is a fantastic wild rose. Um, it smells great, it looks great, it's really pretty, it tangles up on, on vegetation so it can get quite high. And it's really, really important for pollinators. Um, I've seen tons and tons of bees, everything from social bees to such bees using this, using this flower. And it tends to flower for, for a, good, uh, a good amount of time. So you, you know, you, you've got this foraging source that's, that's filling a gap over a, a long period of time. Um, you have your sort of knapweeds and, and 
and uh, toad fluxes as well, which are quite interesting because they're sort of later in the season. Um, they tend to attract pollinators when other flowers aren't in flower. Um, and they just, they're a really good nectar source and they're really interesting looking plants as well. I think they're quite interesting in themselves. And um, one of my favourite plants though is um, oxide daisy. So a lot of people will think that oxide daisy is a bit bog standard, you know, sort of see it on roadside verges. It's not particularly amazing. But for me, as an entomologist, when I go out and I see oxide daisy, I know I'm going to see insects. I know I'm probably going to see mine bees. Um, and that's a really great feeling because um, it allows you to sort of target your surveying. It allows you to, to, to stay in an area and collect a lot of species at once. Um, and it also, it's quite abundant in our area. And it's quite sort of nicely distributed. And it has a long flowering time. It'd be interesting to find out actually how long oxide daisy flowers for because of all the plants that I've looked at, they, they seem to be, they're really consistent. You know, they flower regularly and for a long period of time and they, they keep providing nectar. And where you have some die, new ones pop up. So it's, it's, fun, it's a fantastic, fantastic resource. In fact, if I had to pick a single flower to introduce to your garden for pollinators, it would probably be oxide daisy. Um, it's a really, really interesting, um, interesting flower. And then the other one is personal favourite, it's Bugle. Um, and the reason I like Bugle is because it's this small, it's almost like a little shrubby plant. Um, and you can really easily miss it because it's just so small, it can get overgrown by grass. Um, but it's, it's purple um, and it's a really, really good source uh, of pollen for early uh, emerging bumblebees and solitary bees as well. So your mason bees quite, quite like to feed from, from Bugle. Um, and it tends to be that when you have um, blue and purple flowers, they tend to do they tend to be more attractive to bees than uh, sort of your whites and your pinks and your yellows. And the reason is bees can only see a certain proportion of the visible light spectrum. They can only see everything from sort of blue onwards and um, to taking into account your purples as well. And um, whereas we have you know, a full range, um, the it, it's difficult for a bee to actually find nest uh, pollen, pollen sources in its environment. So if, if colour can really help, track track down a, a, an important flower that needs to feed on but yeah these are all really useful flowers there's many many more and um, many books out there where you can find about uh, planting for pollinators um but yeah these are the ones that i would i would go go for but even better you could just leave your garden and um, so one of the best things that i i found is that if you just leave an area i mean we have a kind of obsession um i don't know how to say this country but probably around the world, where we like nice, neat lawns. Um, we think it looks tidy. Um, and uh, it, I mean, it, I guess in a sense it probably is, but it looks so boring, right, in, compared to this, where it, if you just leave things to grow, um, you'll get this massive flush of diversity of wildflowers. And there's actually a campaign called No Mo May. I think it's run by Plant Life. Um, and the, the idea is that throughout the month of May, you just don't mow your lawn. Um, and it's you'd be amazed at the kind the, the change of, of your garden, the amount of wildlife that comes to your garden. Um, in my garden, we my parents really like to have a nice immaculate lawn, you know, mown within an inch of its life. And during the lockdown period, I, I basically said I'm going to cut off the top, a top section of the garden. I'm just going to leave it to grow wild. So don't cut it. And the amount of wildlife that I found in that little section of garden was incredible. I had shield bugs, I had bees, I had wasps, I had butterflies, and the rest of the garden was just completely barren. Um, and it's because in in though in that grass, in in those tall shrubs, in those flowers, um, you get the the hiding places, the little micro habitats, the diversity of of, of little micro habitats, little places where things can hide, um, things can nest under rocks, um, beneath the soil. So probably the, one of the best things we could do as a country um, it, to, to help bees is to just leave things alone. Um, stop cutting our lawns as much, just, just leave them a bit and, and monitor it and see what comes through. And, and I, I promise you, it's a really rewarding experience um, to, just, just let, to just let things grow. The other thing you can do is you create nesting habitats. Um, so this can be quite um, varied depending on where you are, but you can create ground nesting habitats or you can also or you can create uh, cavity nesting habitats ground nesting habitats tend to um, be a lot harder to create but you can make them you know like the bee banks that we talked about earlier you just need sandy soil 
the sort of right mixture of substrate and you just put it in a, in a sunny south facing area of your garden. Um, but cavity nesting habitats, they're much more, more easy to make. You literally just need um, bits of dead wood um, or some areas where you can sort of drill some holes in. And people like to use bits of bamboo sometimes as well. Um, and again, you just need to put a, a box or, or that, that nesting space at head height and south facing wall where it gets lots of sunshine and heat. Um, and you'll, you'll get insects move in. Remember that nesting space is scarce because in the natural world, A, a lot of the bare earth has been built on and developed. So if you think about the ground nesting bees, they no longer really have that opportunity to nest in those areas. But for the um, cavity nesting species, they would naturally nest in dead wood in the wild. So they would go into woodlands, they would be nesting underneath bits of dead bark, um, in standing bits of, of trees that have died. Um, but because of sort of health and safety uh, these days, we cut down a lot of uh, the dead wood that we have, particularly standing dead wood. And it's a real problem because a huge number of invertebrates in the United Kingdom, I think we've got 27,000 species of insects in the UK, something like that. And um, a huge, huge proportion of them are saprocytic. They like to nest in dead wood or they have a relationship with dead wood in some way. And you'd be surprised how many bees actually have this relationship. Sometimes um, you can go to a site where there'll, there'll be sort of no flowers, right? It could be like an urban park. There's no flowers around. It's all immaculately cut. Um, and uh, the only, you can find a, a single piece of dead tree and inside that single piece of their tree will be all of the pollinators, all of the cavity nesting pollinators for the whole of the site in one single habitat. And that's because the nesting space is rare. So when they find a bit, they all just jump on it and gregariously nest there. But also um, bees like humans and like many other animals like to nest near members of their own species. Um, and that's why you get often aggregations forming in bee communities. So an aggregation is different to a hive or a colony. They don't really interact, but they'll use the same nesting space. They'll live in the same area. Um, and often what you, what you have when you have that is you have um, reduced parasitism, reduced predation because all the bees are sort of living together. But it's really easy to create nesting sites. Um, I, can, I can give uh, plenty more information about this um, if anyone wants to get in contact with me. Um, and I think it's, it's, a really, it's a really promising and useful thing uh, Thing to do um, and it's a simple way of of, of giving back of, of providing something in your garden that can really support populations um and yeah i and, and i think probably the final thing i'll say on this is that um it's a great way of studying bees a lot of people um there's a lot of controversy around bee hotels and are they good and do they harm bees a poorly looked after bee hotel can be dangerous to bee populations, but a well looked after, well maintained bee hotel is a fantastic resource, not only for supporting wild populations of bees, but also for studying them. Because it can, you can literally stand there, you can watch them go in and out, you can teach children about you know, the importance of pollination, you can actually see them carrying pollen back and forth, and you can sort of look at the wider context of how this shapes and, and, and makes the environment which we, which we all live in. Um, so yeah, creating nesting sites would be one of the key things that I would say um, to do if you're interested in getting involved in bee conservation. And I think that's it for me, although there's a time for questions at the end, but 